materials. I'll do it again from the beginning, okay? Because apparently it wasn't recording. So second matrix, you'll go to A, the Japan, go over here to edit, to enter them. So go all the way to edit, and then you highlight the one you want to edit. I want to edit matrix A, because I want to enter this part of the uh, system. So I'm going to hit enter. I have one, two, three rows. So you highlight three and then hit enter. And I have three variables. So I'm going to have three columns. Hit three, enter, and then OK. And then it pops up the uh, template. Usually they all have zeros if you've never entered one. Then you can start putting in your coefficient. So coefficient of one, coefficient of one, coefficient of one. Here, there's no ways. So we put a zero for the coefficient. Here we have negative two for B, positive two for C, negative four for A, and then no Bs and no Cs. Once you have that matrix in there, just like you want, you go second and then mode so you can get out of there. So second, quit. And then you still have to put the one, one away, one away. So we'll go back second matrix. We're gonna go back to edit. But this time we're going to make a new matrix. You don't want to mess with the one you just entered. And then you hit enter. This one only has, it has three rows, so three, and it only has one column. So just enter one and OK. And then you can type in your one, 108, 108. Make sure you hit enter when you type it in there. So you can go to the next one and then 108, enter, 108. Enter. Now that both are in there, you can quit. And then now we can enter this. So we go second matrix one, second matrix, move over to map and go to three. So you can put inverse. And it should put that little symbol in there. And then second matrix and then B. And then if you hit enter, it tells you all the answers. So the top one is A, the middle one is B, and the bottom one is C. Always do them alphabetically, especially when you type in this. Make sure you're doing all the first A's, the B's, the C's, if you have B's, whatever it is. I just wanted to talk about that. Sure, go ahead. I was going to say this helps out so much because this is the part that I kept getting stuck on forever. Right, right. Yes, for sure. It won't help with them giant ones because <laughs> I know there's one in the homework that has like A, B, C, D. And as long as you have only three, no, it won't matter. You can only have three variables and three constants, and you can do it in the calculator. If you don't have three variables and three, um, uh, not constants, three variables and three equations, you could do it. But if you have more than three variables or if you have more than three equations, you do have to do it by hand. You could always text me though, because I know these assignments are coming out to do this Friday, right? So if you get to one of those bigger ones and you're getting uh, lost in all of that, just let me know and I can kind of figure out where it's going wrong. Okay. Especially the big ones. The smaller ones, you'll be able to do this. And you will have a smaller one on the test just because they take too long, right? Okay, I just wanted to make sure I'm showing you that because we were talking about it and I was like, wait a minute, there is a better way. Okay, and that was our one of the problems. Let's see, thank you. One of the problems on the review, but We'll talk about it when we get to that problem if we need to. Okay, so sorry about that. I just had to talk about it real quick because <laughs> I thought like it was super, super helpful. Um, so back to this one. Um, we talked about in problems one through three, right? If they ask you if it's proper or improper, if it is improper, your only answer is going to be because at least one of the limits of integration are not finite. 
if it is proper, then you're going to select that the limits of integration are finite and that it's continuous. Okay, so we'll start with this one. Now we have integrated something like this. We just haven't done it with an infinity up there in the top half. So we do have to change the notation of this according to the definitions. Since the bottom one's usually A and the top one's B, we're gonna say B is going to this positive infinity. Yeah. And then we'll replace that infinity with a B. Now this is um, a by parts. So remember we learned by parts, I forgot what section it was, 8.2 or 8.3, one of those two, I think it was 8.2. So we will do by parts, tabular method can be done on this one because X will eventually go to zero, right? If I do all the derivatives of it. So we'll go ahead and do the tabular method. So we'll have our U and our D. And let's see, U will be the X. When I take its derivative, I will get one. When I take its derivative, I will get zero. So then I only need to do pretty much two integrals. The first one is what looks here. So e to the negative x over eight. So whenever you take the integral of e, you get the exact same thing, but then you divide by the exponent. And if I divide by or divide by the derivative of the x one, the derivative of negative x over eight is negative one over eight. But if I divide by a negative one over eight, it's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, right? So all I'm doing is multiplying by negative eight. And if you're unsure, take the derivative of it and see if you get what was up there. If I take the derivative of this, it's going to be e to the negative x over eight, which is there. But then I would have to multiply the chain rule, right? Times the derivative of this. So you have a negative one eighth over here and won't that cancel the negative eight there? And so you do get this as a derivative, okay? So you can kind of check yourself when you're doing those integrations. But normally we always divide by the derivative of the exponent, okay? So what's gonna happen here is I'm gonna get the same integral and I have this negative eight here, but then I'm going to divide by another negative one eight, which is the same as multiplying by another negative eight. So what's this negative eight times another negative eight? Positive 64. And we know from the tabular method that the first one's always positive, and then they, they uh, swap, they just cycle plus, minus, plus, minus, depending on how far down you have to go. So then we're going to multiply these two together. We'll multiply these two together. And you really don't need to multiply by anything else because it'll just be zero, right? So we end up with the limit as b goes to infinity. Uh, that will actually turn into a negative 8 x e to the negative x over 8. This one will multiply to give me a negative 64 e to the negative x over 8. And we don't put plus c because we do have bounds. So we do have to plug in our bounds to get rid of e. But before I do that, I want to get these in their fraction forms because those negative exponents, these guys are fractions in, the side, in disguise. So if I take those negative exponents and make them positive, it's going to force the E to go downstairs. Then I will plug in my bounds and we'll do the limit last. So when I plug in B, this is going to be 8B E to the B over 8 and then B over H here. 
Now here I get negative eight times zero and then e to the zero over eight. And the only thing that simplifies is that second fraction. This one is just going to stay the way it is. Now, I could distribute, but what's going to happen to that first, first term? This one here. Does it matter what the denominator is? No, because you have zero at the top, right? The only time it'd be a problem is if you had zero over zero. That's what they call indeterminate, like you don't know what the answer is gonna be. Um, but this one's not because zero over eight is zero, isn't it? And what's anything to the power of zero? Just one. So this bottom part turns into a one and the top part turns into a zero. So if you have zero over one, it's just zero, right? So I don't need to have this third term here. It's just zero. I don't need to minus zero, right? But over here, the same thing happens at the bottom. E to the zero is one. But when I distribute that negative, it's actually gonna be plus 64. Because 64 over the one is just 64. Now, I don't know how much I'll remember from Calc 1, but I am going to separate this. And the reason why is because that first um, limit requires me to use the open So again, I don't very much know how much you remember <laughs> Cal one, but L'Hopital's rule should have been talked about in there. Um, and I can't remember if we talked about it in here. I don't recall. Um, 3.6, something in the chat. Oh, okay. No worries, no worries. It's recording, Trevor, so if anything happens and you miss some parts, you can go back and watch that. So the limit of a constant is, is nice. It's just Thank that you. constant. Sure. Sorry, I got, I got kicked off my laptop, just froze, so I joined back over here, sorry. Sure, no worries. So now here, when I go to infinity, if B is going to infinity, you have P raised to the infinity. That just means it's going to infinity even faster, okay? Because it's an exponential. So if you have 64 over something that's going to infinity, we talked about that, right? The denominator getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, which is making the fraction value get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Eventually, it goes to zero. When you have a constant over infinity, it will go to zero. Okay. The other problem, though, I forgot my little B, sorry. This one here does require me to use the big problem. Because if I try to do the joints, it will go away. If I try to plug in infinity right now, you're going to get infinity over another infinity. And that's one of those indeterminate forms. Okay. You can't tell what it's going to be because you don't know which infinity is bigger or smaller or any of that. Okay. So what we have to do is the talk rule, which basically tells me that this limit is the same exact answer as if I were to take the limit of the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. The derivative of the denominator requires us to use chain rule. So then now you have B going to infinity, which means E is going to infinity which means your whole denominator, even if I cut that infinity into an eighth of its size, it's still forever, right? It's still infinity. 
So this whole denominator is going to infinity. Any constant over an infinity will go to zero. So we actually end up with 64 as my final value for the integral. And 64 is a finite number, right? Which means that my integral converges. Spilled my coffee all over myself. I smell like coffee. <laughs> I can smell it a little bit. Can you see the basketball? Sure. If you did that, that's fine. You would have gotten the limit as B goes to infinity of negative 64 over this. Yes. It didn't even matter about that going up there because the bottom is still infinity. And you still have a constant over infinity, which will still go to the zero. But yes, you could manipulate it to the like that. It'll still do the same thing, right? But you can, if it helps your brain, go for it. <laughs> if it helps your brain to get rid of that one eight, that's okay. I just said, since this is one eight, I mean, since this is infinity, even if I cut that infinity into just an eighth of it, it's still infinity because infinity goes forever and ever. So even if I just take an eighth of it, it's still infinity. And there's one specific one that I want to talk about. And I think this one, that one works as this one. This is example two. This is not example two. Let me have more paper. Okay, this is example four actually, so I'll save that one for later. So my second example, I'm gonna do this this one. I saw one like this in your that wasn't like this. I think I do want to Yeah, it is this crazy problem. I was copying down the problems because I scribbled those for those problems one through three. But we did those early. So this one's really weird. We're going to try to work it out and find out if it converges or diverges. But it was really strange and there was some really weird stuff happening with it as we went about. And so I definitely wanted to talk about this. And I try to write notes for myself, but I can't even read my writing. So we're just gonna go for it. <laughs> we'll see what we get. What's I doing? Oh, I know what I did. Okay. So the first thing that I did when I was working on this, because I was like, this one looks crazy, I'm gonna do it in class. And I thought, well, let me do it beforehand just so I can make sure, is we need to rewrite this. We don't want these guys to have the negative exponents. So if I were to rewrite that, I'm not even doing the limit yet. Okay, I'm not going to mess with that. I'm just going to work with modifying this. Okay. This would be e to the 4x plus 1 over e to the 4x. Okay. When you write it like that, now you have what's called the complex fraction. Okay. So you got a fraction inside of a fraction, right? You've got this little tiny fraction inside this big giant fraction. So what we have to do is we have to get rid of the complexity of it by multiplying each term in the numerator and the denominator by the common denominators of all three. So if you think about this, this is just one over one, right? This was just e to the four x over one. And then that's already a fraction. So looking at all of their denominators, your common denominator is going to be that e to the 4x. 
So what I'm going to do is multiply each one of those three terms by e to the 4x. So this one, and I'll do it over here, that one, and then I'll do it over here, that one. What ends up happening is you end up with e to the 4x in the numerator. Down here, they should cancel, right? And you just end up with one. The questionable one is this first term at the bottom. What do you get when you do e to the 4x times e to the 4x? Not one. When you have one divided and one multiplied, they cancel and you get the one. But here, you just have e to the power times e to the power. When your bases are the same and you're multiplying, what do you do with the exponents? You add them. Mm -hmm. So we're not combining one term, we're not adding them. If this was e to the 4x plus e to the 4x, yes, it would be two e to the 4x's, right? But you're multiplying them. So if I had x squared times x squared, what do you get? So four, because you're adding the exponents, right? So it's the same thing here. If I have these two guys are multiplied with the same base, I have to add their exponents. So we're going to get e to the 8x. And now here I'm going to go ahead and write the limit because I am going to start trying to integrate this thing. And it's the top bound again, so I'm using b. And then we change the infinity to b. Now I have not done my use of yet but this is a U substitution. Specifically, it's gonna lead me to arc trig, arc 10. Because I do have something squared plus something squared at the bottom, and I have the derivative of that variable portion squared. So if anything, let's rewrite it with the squares, and then it'll be more easily identifiable. So for the number, one squared is one, right? But for the e, it's going to be e to what exponent? So when I multiply it by two, I will get 8x. Mm -hmm. Or x, right? And then when I multiply these exponents, I will get that 8x. Now if I let u equal e to the 4x. du is going to be e to the 4x divided by the derivative of that exponent, which is 4. I have e to the 4x dx, don't I? I just don't have this extra 4 constant. So we'll multiply both sides by 4. And now we know what to replace e to the 4x dx. So I can write this as one and then e to the four x dx on the side, but the e to the four x dx is gonna become four du. Down here, I would have u squared still plus one squared. I'm going to actually integrate here. So when I integrate, I have this four multiplier, right? That multiplier. But one over u squared plus one squared is going to give me one over a times arctan of u over a. And I still have to plug in zero to B. I would like to clean that up before I go plug in zero and B. 
So four times one over one is just four. And instead of writing u over one, it could just be u. But remember, these bounds were for x. So I'm going to fax up what u was. And u was e to the 4x. So now we can plug in our piece. So we get 4 arc 10 of e to the 4b minus 4 arc 10 e to the 4 times 0. What do I get inside this second parenthesis? Mm -hmm, it is one. Because four times zero is zero, right? And anything to the power zero is just one. So we have our 10. I'm going to bring them to put like an ingredient mode. And then R10 of what? This is the way I do in a calculator. I do this button right here, right? Twice, I get R10 or 10 inverse, they're the same thing. And then I put in the one and I got this, but I wanted it in radians. It is in radians, but I need to have it like in terms of pi. So I divide by pi to find out what the multiplier is. And the multiplier is one fourth, isn't it? So this is just, this part is just four times pi over four. This other one is a whole lot more complicated for me to explain. <laughs> okay. I could try to plug in infinity. I could try. If I plug in infinity, it's going to be four times infinity. What is four times infinity? Infinity. And what's e to the infinity? Anything raised to the infinity power will be infinity. Okay. So this is completely informal. I'm never supposed to plug in infinity, but whatever. I'm going to do it because it's going to help me. Now, this is the weird part. <laughs> And they don't tell you why the answer is what it is. Okay. There's two ways to do it. And one of the ways I'm pretty sure you don't remember. Does anybody know what the graph of tangent looks like? Like, just you know exactly what the graph looks like. You know the domain of it. You know exactly what it looks like. Probably not, right? It's just not something people remember. If I wrote a graph, okay. It does have a domain of negative pi over two and pi over two. And it does do this. So it goes up to infinity over there and down to infinity over here. Okay. And so then when is it going? When is the value going to infinity? It happens at this value pi over two, it goes to infinity. Okay. So you would get four times pi over two, which is what, two pi, something like that. However, there's another way to get this pi over two answer, okay? And it's gonna require me not to use the graphic tangent, but just to use some logic, okay? So if I wanna know what arc 10 of infinity is, this is what I'm trying to figure out, little question mark, right? So it's the same thing as saying the tangent of what angle Will give me infinity. Okay. Now on the graph, you can see, right? On the graph, you can tell this angle makes the y value, the tangent go to infinity, right? But what if we don't have the graph? Okay. We have to remember we're doing limits. So we're not necessarily saying that it is infinity, we're saying that it's going to infinity. Okay. So if something is going to go to infinity, how does that happen? 
it happens when you get one over zero. Because as this goes to zero, right? As your denominator goes to zero, it means it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. What that means is when you get a fraction, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Kind of like the reverse of the other way around, right? When the bottom gets bigger, the whole fraction gets smaller. Well, now if the bottom gets smaller, the fraction gets bigger. So let me show you an example of that. Let's say I divide by 0.5, right? 0 0.5. That's a pretty uh, small decimal, right? And I get two. But what happens if that denominator gets even smaller? Now I'm doing 0.25. And it's getting bigger, isn't it? I could do it some more. I could do point zero 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 one. It's real tiny, but look at the fraction value. It's really large. Okay. So as your denominator gets tinier and tinier, the fraction does get super large. So really what I'm looking for is the tangent of an angle that gives me these values. Remember, this one is sine of whatever that angle is, and this one is cosine of whatever that angle is. And if you were to break your unit circle, where does that happen? When is the y value one and the x value zero? It happens right there, doesn't it? And on my unit circle, what is that angle of measurement? Pi over two or 90 degrees, right? So that's another way to explain why it's pi over two, okay? But this one at least, it makes more sense without having to memorize what the graph of tangent looks like. Okay. But it is logic. So you're just saying, how would I get to infinity? I can only get there if my denominator is going to zero. Well, which value is going to make my cosine go to zero, but my sine go to one? Okay. So we do have this now. This is pi over two. So then what I'm really doing is two pi minus pi. And so I end up with pi as my integral after everything. Not even what I got over here. And then because this is a finite number, right? It is a number that exists, then that tells me that the whole integral converges. That one was really, really weird. That was really weird. But I wanted to talk about it because if you saw it on your own, you're like, how in the world are they getting pi over two? Okay. So it's two, it's one in the graph, or two, in order for me to get infinity, it has to be going to one over zero. So the review is down here in the module 10, like right above where it says Lindy. So if you haven't tried it or started it yet, you can go through there. Now for the note sheet, this is the same note sheet that you'll see on the test. So it has all of the integral rules, right? All the derivative rules in case you need to reference them. It has that unit circle. It tells you that tangent is sine over cosine somewhere down here. There we go. Tangent is sine over cosine in case you forget, right? Um, it has those power reducing formulas, right, that we were using in some of those integrals. Um, 
And that's pretty much all I think you'll use. Oh, and your Pythagorean identities. I think we use those quite a bit in this chapter too. So the Pythagorean identities are reducing are here. And you even have those relationships for when we did the trick sub, right? And then you had the back sub later. I told you go use your triangle. So if you forget what cosecant, secant, all of those are, it does tell you in here too, like a top, top opposite over hypotenuse or whatever it is. Okay. So that when you have your little triangle set up, you can get the correct sides to go in the numerator and not make it yourself. Um I also have the biparts formula here. There's no nothing that tells me about the tabular method, but if you know how to use the tabular method, you're more than welcome to use it. Okay. You don't have to just do this formula and then repeat it if it's necessary. You can do the tabular method. And I think it says it in it. There's just no box to like summarize the tabular, the tabular method. Um there we go. That's just guidelines for what to let what. Now this one's really small, but it tells you that if you have an odd exponent on the side, then you want to break that one up. You put it to where it's even, and then you have the extra one over here, making it an odd power off to the side. And then you convert the sines into cosines, distribute the cosines later. You might have to do some um the power reducing formulas, right? But you should be able to integrate that letter D equal cosine and then D equal negative sine. Similarly, with the other way around, if your cosine has the odd exponent, then it's the cosine that you split up, right? You get the evens together, the odd one to the side, then you convert all of your cosines into sines, and then you should be able to use them. And even give you the power reducing formulas here, although they are up at the top as well. Um, there is Wallace's formula in here. Now, it'll never say to use Wallace's formula, but if you identify that it can be used, you are more than welcome to use it. Okay. So if you see a problem with cosine or sine, remember we talked about it's the same formulas, regardless if it says cosine or sine. Okay, so if you're doing from zero to pi over two, either of this sine by itself or just cosine by itself, you can use these little like shortcuts for this wall is there or wall is formula. Tangent is and secant or the other kind of situation going on, right? So if you're I can't see what that says. Um if it's even if your secants are even, then you basically set two of them aside so that you can be tangent and then the D would be secant squared. And then you convert the other remaining secants into tangents and you go at it. However, if your secants are not even, if they're odd, then you need to make sure that tangent also has an odd power. And if it does, you're gonna set aside one secant and one tangent, okay? And then you'll let u equal secant, so all your tangents will have to get converted over to secant. We do have examples. <laughs> um, and if it does have tangents all by itself, you want to put one, uh, two of them off to the side, you need the rest of them, and then convert those two into secants, and then you should be able to match um, one of these two things up here at the top. And then secant to the end, that's, we don't see that a whole lot just because it requires by parts and it's pretty complicated, so we never usually see secant by itself. Um, these are the trig substitution stuff, so you will have all of those bits of information. And the only way you will ever select this bottom one, negative tan theta, is if you are given bounds, okay? And in those bounds, that range of x values is bigger than, or I'm sorry, is less than whatever the opposite of your a is, okay? So if you had bounds, let's say from zero to one, no, if you had, if your bounds would have to be negative. So if you had bounds from negative one to zero, but then A was, I don't know, I can't think right now, right now. So if I had bounds, let's say negative two to negative one, and A was equal to one. What do you think, oh, to be more sure? If my bounds were this and my A value was one, 
my x's here are between negative three and negative two, right? And negative a would be negative one. So aren't these x's less than negative one, right? That's the only time when you would be selecting that bottom negative a tangent wave, which it hardly ever happens. Normally we don't give you negative bounds, okay? This just doesn't say that it won't ever happen. It could happen, okay? Won't happen on the test, I promise you that, but <laughs> it could happen, so we have to mention it, okay? Okay, then we have our partial fraction decomp situation. So there is a little box that tells you kind of the summary of what's going on with those, right? So if you have just regular linear factors, they just go all to themselves. But if you have a repeated factor, you do have to keep increasing that exponent until you get to the exponent that you have. And then of course our quadratics, they don't just have A on top, they have a coefficient times X plus a constant. Okay. So you do have that as a guide if you need it. Um, and then these are all the different uh, ways to rewrite your improper integrals. So it's just reminding you how to rewrite them. Um, now, improper integral converges when the limit exists, which means when you get a finite number, and then it'll diverge when you get an improper answer, which is like positive infinity or negative infinity. Okay. Oh, see, I do see one that could be, oh, and it says use one since I lied. I didn't think it said that, but it did. I thought I left it to, <laughs> to discover, to wonder, but it does say use false is there. It does a wrong name too, as well as. Um, yeah, I think all of these are stuff that we've seen before. See, that was the problem I had to do in the calculator. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to start from the beginning? Do you use there certain ones that you want me to talk about? We have the rest of class today at next class. Oh, one. One? Okay. Yeah. Test three. You I'll write it down and then I'll make the the paper bigger. So zero to three. 33 and then 6x minus x squared. So this one will require us to use um, the completing the square. Like that one we have up here. I'm going to post this. Okay, so for this one. Because it has the radical, I'm pretty sure this one is, and it has the higher power, the one behind the minus. I think that's arc sine, but I'm not sure. Let me double check with the formulas. So I think that one fits arc sine. So yeah, see how the number 18 and the basic integration formulas, it had the variables behind the minus, right? The higher variables behind the minus. So we're going to have to manipulate ours so that it can look like a constant squared minus something with variables squared. So let's go back over here. So let's do that on the side. So the first thing I'm going to do is rearrange these so that x squared is in the front, but it is negative. Then I have to factor out whatever the coefficient is of x squared. You have to factor it out. So that 6x turns into negative. Right, if I distribute the negative, I have the original. 
then here's where we'll leave some space to add a subtract number. So what we're going to do is we're going to take negative six over two and square it. So that would be negative three squared, which is actually nine. So I'm going to add nine and then I'm going to minus nine. Now, the one with the plus is the one I need to complete the square, okay? The one with the minus has to get kicked out. So I am going to have to distribute this negative to that guy to kick him out of the parentheses. So then over here, it becomes plus 9. And over here, I can actually factor this. I want to write that better. So when I factor this, x times x is going to give me the x squared, and then 3 times 3 will give me the 9 and the 6, but in order for me to get negative 6, it will have to be minus 3 minus 3. So if I rewrite it as a square, it'll look like that, and then remember we want our constant in the front, so we'll do 9 minus this. I'm going to kick the 33 out because I don't like it up there. But that 6x minus x squared turned into this. So in the radical, I'm now going to have 9 minus x minus 3 squared. So over here, my a is 3, right? It's 3 squared gives me the 9. And then my u is the x minus 3. That's the variable part that's being squared. And if I want to calculate du, it's just going to be 1 dx or just dx. So this will be a squared minus u squared and then du, which we know is the arc 10. Now the arc 10 does not have the one over a anymore. It's just arc 10. I'm oh, sorry, why am I saying 10? 18, right? Rule 18, not arc 10. Rule 18 is arc 5. And our sign does not have the one over a in front, but it does have u over a inside the angle. I just can't plug in the three and the zero yet because three and zero were for x, right? So we do have to back step real quick. So u was x minus three and a was three. And I usually show this step, but some people don't. They just put the next sign. That's okay. They'll do three minus three, which is zero over three and gets zero in their head. And then zero minus three divided by three is negative one. So if you go from here to here, that's okay. Do you have an art sign button? So I'm going to hit sign, sign, zero. And I just get zero. So this is 33 times zero for this whole thing. And then our sign of negative one is that. But if I divide by pi, I can get what multiplier of pi it is. And it's negative pi over two.
Well, yeah, that, that button above header changes its title. Did you hit this button? Oh, not there. That one. Oh, nice. Okay, now we did that. Really nice. Good to know. Thank you. My blue one doesn't do it, but this one does. So it's called a pro, right? <laughs> okay, so then we get those would be positive 30, 35 over 2. Let me see. Yes, and I think in a computer it asks you to enter it as a decimal. So if I type 33 pi over 2 in my calculator and I hit the double arrow, it'll tell me that desk. So this actually rounds to 51.836 since the 2 will not change the 6. So this is actually what you type in the computer. Because in all the directions, it tells you how to type it. And I think, let me go back to it real quick, but I think it does see decimal. Yes, round your answer to the nearest thousand. So tens, hundreds, thousands, three decimal places. And just like before, if you get a 70 on the review or higher, let me know and I'll send you the, the solutions so that way you're uh, studying the correct way to work them up. It's only one way to work them up. Some of them have given choices, right? But at least you'll have some reference to study. So we need to email you, right? Once we do yes. get a second interview? Okay. You can text me. Text me is better. On the... Because I, I, the okay. <clears throat> I get those straight on my phone and then I go and do it, whatever it is. I mean, I check my email every day, but not on the weekend. <laughs> so give one solution, especially on the weekend, and make sure you're texting. Right, we'll come in here. You need to spend like an hour and working on this one. Yeah, we were changing signs and whole seeking and stuff. Um, yeah, they they don't tutor calculus, and then I because I used to work in there. That's how I started working in math world as a tutor. I got my math, my bachelor's degree. I went in there and I started working as a tutor. And then when I got my master's degree, the position opened up and then I applied and I got it by default. So I was like runner up, but the first guy didn't want to accept whatever they were going to pay him. So they offered it to me and I was like, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, I was, I mean, he was like a doctor or something or another. And I had literally just got my master's degree. Wow. So I totally understood why they chose him over me, but <laughs> but I did luck out and get the position by the bolt, so I'm still happy though. I care. <laughs> um, and then you have to work like for six years to eventually get tenure. So for six years, I was under like probation, and then eventually I got tenure. So it's a struggle, but it's okay. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here to stay. So yeah, I, I tutored calculus and I even tutored some of the math courses that people would take at UTSA when they would leave us, the theory classes, and I would tutor all of them. So then they started offering tutoring for calculus. But then when I left in 2010, they've kind of just been trying to do calculus. <laughs> There's not a lot of them in there. They can do it for the most part, but I think the hard ones they really, really struggle. You can always text me. And even with the even with the tutors, like, hey, we need tutor working on this, and we can't figure it out, and I'll kind of give you like a little wording, and then you can tell that to the tutor, and hopefully it jogs back their their memory. How far are the math? How far are the math? Do they have to go? They only have to have a bachelor's degree to be a tutor in there. So as long as they have a bachelor's, and it has to be in math or engineering. So as long as they have a bachelor's degree in math or engineering, then they're a tutor. Whatever the math requirements are for that engineering. So they would have had all the classes that we teach here, but what do they remember? <laughs> That's a whole nother situation. I'll say it was a long time. Right, exactly. It is. 
for a lot of people, it was a long time ago. Okay, do we want to do another one? Is there a specific one anybody wants to see? Or do you want me to start them in order and hope that we get to the end? I mean, I think we go about it. We have today and tomorrow. So I'm pretty sure if I go through it, we should be able to cover all of it. So do you want me to just start? Go on to number two and go on the way down. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I needed somebody else's thing, and not just me making all the decisions. Okay, let me write this one. So number two. And if you want to practice more of them, I would say go through your homework and try to find some that are similar. If you're like really trying to just practice more of the same type. But number one came from 8.1. And so does number two. So if you find some in 8.1 that look like number one and number two, should be able to practice them. We write here from one, and it's from T one. Now I'm doing number two, and this one's also from T one. Which you don't know that by looking at it, right? But I do because I know it's just experience. It's all it is. I've done a million of these stupid things, so I kind of can look at it and know where it's going to go. Okay. So like that one, I know I have to complete the square. And then I'm going to get something squared plus something else squared, or maybe minus. And then that should follow one of our integration rules. So we definitely need to complete this square. And I know that I need to complete the square because if I were to let you, I'm going to write this in red, but then I'm going to scratch it all out. If I were to try to just do u sub straight off the top, when I go to do du, I have 2x minus 16. This is not a problem, okay? What's the problem is, is that your du has a variable in here that you don't have, okay? It's okay when the u has the variables, it's okay, that's fine. But when du has a variable that you don't have, you cannot do the u sub. It's just not possible, okay? So since I don't have this extra x in my numerator, I cannot do that method. Mm -hmm. At least not yet, right? But if I complete the square, maybe then I'll be able to do so. We'll see what it looks like, okay? So let's go ahead and do completing the square part. And instead of putting the plus 77 next to this, remember you're trying to find that magic number to add so that this will be a perfect square, right? So I'm actually going to put minus a blank and then put my plus 77 off to the end. This will give me that little extra number, whatever it is. But how do we get that number? We have to do negative 16 over 2 squared. So whatever's in front of the x. That's negative 8 squared, which is 64. So I need to add 64 and subtract 64 so that I'm not changing the value of the original trinomial. Then these two I can factor. Um, it'll be eight times eight is 64. They also give me 16, but if I want negative 16, they have to be minuses. And then here, negative 64 plus 77 is 13, positive 13. So here, if I let, I think there's a formula, I think this one's the arctic. So let me go look at my little formula sheet real quick. I think it is. 
Uh, yes. So if I have my variable squared and my constant squared being added at the bottom, no radical. Okay. Does it really matter which one's in front when there's a plus sign? It's the same thing, right? U squared plus A squared is the same as A squared plus U squared. So I do have something that looks kind of like number 19. If you want to rearrange it, you can, I'm not gonna. <laughs> so I'm definitely gonna say here that U is this X minus eight and A, since this is not a perfect square, I'm gonna say it's the square root of 13. So that when I square it, it's that 13 X there. But here, when I find du, I just get one and then dx. And I do have that, right? One and dx. So the x minus eight became the u. The 13 is actually a squared. And then the dx became the du. And according to that formula, it should be one over a arctan of u over a. And I do have bounds, so no plus c. But remember, these are x values, not u's. So let's go put back the u and the a. So that would be x minus a for u. And square root of 13 for a. So one. Zero. And I'm going to be lazy and just type that whole thing in the calculator. Probably get a decimal so that you put my little squiggly rounded do that. So one over square root of 13. Scoop to the side. And then arc 10 means I hit this button two times. And then I could do that. That's maybe the seven or eight. That's not too bad. Square root of 13, close it, minus one over square root of 13, <clears throat> and then that inverse or arc 10, that's negative eight over square root of 13. And that's what we get. I get 0 0.014. I don't know what it asked me to round to check quickly. To the nearest thousand. I need to fix this direction. It shouldn't say thousand. It should say thousand, right? TH. So I need to change those. I'll go in there and edit it. Tenths, hundreds, thousands with a th. I have the answers, I'm going to sure they're right. <laughs> yes. So I'm sure you can find some. Some examples similar in 8.1. So I know in the previous test, some of you guys have been trying to integrate products without doing really use of, and y'all have just been like integrating one of the multiples and then integrating the other multiple. It's been happening. Um, and all I've been writing on your papers is there's no rule that says you can do that. <laughs> But now we do have a rule that lets us do those products, and that's that um, by parcel. Okay. 
So if you do see something with a variable times something else with a variable, you can probably do it by, by parts. Unless it's trig, because trig requires all the little formulas, right? I don't know paper, so I'm trying to erase what I scribbled on this paper. Sorry. And the you pick one if there's three points. You could, but it'll be hard on the technique that they tell you to do. <laughs> I mean, you could. The problem is, is that it never, they're not transcendental, which means they don't eventually go to zero. And if you have a trick function on the right for you and a trick function for db, you could keep taking derivatives and integrals forever and ever and ever, and all they do is just keep cycling around. Um, and unless, unless you do it, remember that one problem we did with CQ? Yeah, and then we had to like, we found one that looked exactly like what we were supposed to be integrating. And so then we moved it over to the other side and then divided by two. That's the only thing that you can, that's the only way to do those ones with straight. And so for me, they're more of a headache than just following their little trick rules. <laughs> so I promise these mathematicians had to do it like that to be changed. And then they noticed a pattern and they're like, oh, wait a minute. It just turns out to be this all the time. We can use our identities. And so they do. So number three is this guy. Now, whenever you have ln of x, um, my advice is to let that be u. I know you want to let u equal x squared because you know that if you take the derivative of x squared enough, it's going to go to zero, right? But the problem is, is that the integral of ln, I don't even know if there's one on this chart. Either it's not there or something really crazy. Um, yeah, no, I don't even have the integral of ln of u. So you cannot integrate. I guess no, we don't. They don't have an integral where it says integral of ln of u du equals one. There's no rule on here that lets you integrate it. Okay. So you can't let the ln of x be the db because you can't integrate ln of x. Okay. But you can take the derivative of ln of x, right? It tells us here that the derivative of ln of something is just the derivative over the original. Okay. So since you can take the derivative of ln, but you can't take the integral of ln, you're going to let the u be the ln. That's what you take derivatives of. And then the db will be the other stuff, the x squared dx. Okay. So then when I do du, the derivative of ln of x is derivative of x, which is one, over the original argument, which is x. And of course, the x. And then for b, we're doing the integral of x squared, which is x cubed over 3. And so now we'll do our formula. B, d. Okay. So let's see, we're gonna have u, which is ln of x, times b, which is x cubed over three, minus the integral, I keep my bounds, and then b, du. Okay, now this doesn't have the bounds, but it should, okay? Because you were integrating it with bounds. So these guys will have to get evaluated. I won't evaluate that yet until I know what this is, and then I'll just evaluate it and you know, one to you. But some of y'all will work on this and work on that at the same time. I don't have to take them alone, but this it's a choice. Okay. So when I integrate this, this is actually going to be x squared over 3. Which is going to be 1 third times x cubed over 3. 
Why is it x squared over there again? The x cancels one of those x's. Oh, duh. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking, because somebody might not have seen that as well. So I'm gonna clean, I don't need to clean it up. I can just plug in E. I get E cubed over three ln of E. And I'll just clean it up now. This will be E cubed over nine. Minus one cubed over three ln of one minus one cubed over nine. I just multiply these guys together. So why is it x to the third now? Sorry. Integrating x squared, you add one to the exponent, divide by the new exponent. Oh, you just moved That's it out. Power rule. And you just moved up to the third, right? Is that what you, what you just factored out the one third and the Right, third. exactly. I factored the one third out and then I integrated just x squared. Gotcha, okay. Just wanted to make sure I was getting that right. Sure. Okay, now what is ln of e? If we don't know we can put it in here, right? We have ln. And then somebody showed me there's e, but in here somewhere. It's on the so five. Here, to the fourth foot down on the right side. So we go one, two, and then we get the E all by itself. And we get plus. So this guy is just one. And the ln of one is zero. So zero times this is just going to be zero. And if I distribute the minus to zero, it's just minus zero. Now over here, though, I'll get plus one nine. I'm just going to type all of that in the calculator. I probably won't type the zero, but I can type um, e to the third power over three minus fraction e to the third power over nine. And then I'm just going to do plus one nine. I don't need to put the minus. And 4.57, ah, but this five will change that four into a five. Then make sure 4.57, okay, good. So you probably have one or two of these in web assignment as well that look like this, where you have x to some power times ln. Go get number four. This may be, I don't know, we might be able to fit number five, but if not, we'll stop at number four. See, this one does, I see a five, and that's my direction. Very vague, but I didn't. I literally told you what to do. <laughs> So this one says, find the definite integral using integration by parts with the tabular method. So this one is asked for the tabular method. Notice the other one did not ask for the tabular method. Okay. And it says, show the integration and the evaluation steps. So I definitely need to see that tabular method, right? So off to the side, with e to the x, this comes in no uh, this is a different situation than that one, okay? You can't integrate e to the power of something. You just get e to the same power, divide by the derivative of the power, okay? So we can do the tabular method with this one. And so this one will eventually go to zero. That's gonna be our u. 
and then the db will be this other guy. So when I take the derivative, I will get 2x. When I take that guy's derivative, I will get 2. And then when I take that guy's derivative, I will get 0. Okay. So I only need to go up to here because then that will have a multiplier, this will have a multiplier, and this will have a multiplier. Anything else below that is just going to get multiplied by a bunch of zeros. So it's unnecessary, right? Just need to go up to where we get the zero. So if I integrate this, it's going to be e to the 6x divided by the derivative of this guy, which is six. Then if I do the integral again, it's gonna be e to the six x divided by another six, but there's already a six there. So it becomes 36, right? Cause I'll multiply together. Then when I do e to the six x again, the integral, there will be another six down there multiplied by the 36. I think that's 216, but let me make sure. 36 times six, yes. Okay, and then I don't have to keep doing it anymore because they're already at that zero. So remember the signs. The first one's always positive, then it just oscillates from there. Negative, positive, negative, okay. So these diagonal go together. So when we get our answer, it's going to be um, positive. So x squared, I like to put the six for the x, but that's just me. Some people just write it x squared times e to the six x over six. It doesn't matter. Some people write one six x squared e to the six x. However you want to write it, just write it. <laughs> now here we'll do those two minus, but those are going to simplify our thing. So I'm actually going to get x over, I think it's 18. Uh, let me make sure because my brain does weird stuff. 30, yeah, I did 36 divided by 18, yes. And then e to the 6x. And then finally the last one, um, 2 over 216 should reduce, and it's 108. So that's a plus sign and no, no um, variable. So it's just 1 over 108 e to the 6x. So I have shown all the method of the integration. What I haven't shown yet is the evaluation step, okay? So for me, for my evaluation step, I'm gonna plug in all the ones and I'm gonna simplify them at the same time. You don't have to do them both the same step, but I am, okay? So one squared is just one over six and then e to the six. So I'm gonna get one e to the six over six. Now, when I put in one here, I'm going to get one over 18 times e to the six, which is e to the six over 18. When I put in one there, I'm going to have e to the six over 108. And now, when I put in the zero, so when I put in zero here, it's zero squared times who cares, right? It's zero. Same thing here zero over 18, zero times anything, zero. And here, when I put in zero, though, it doesn't go to zero. E to the zero is one. So I just get plus one over 108. Now, if you have to write the problem, you know, by putting in one and putting in a zero and then looking at it and simplifying later, it's totally okay. But I at least need to see either those two steps or just one step, okay, before you tell me what the answer is in decimal form. That's what I mean by showing the step of evaluation. Because I think on this last test, there was a couple of people that forgot that step of G evaluation. They did this and then they just wrote down the answer. But that's not the step, showing me the step of your evaluation. Okay, that's just evaluating. But you're not showing me what you're doing. Okay, so let's plug all of that in, see if we get the same decimal and have the solution. <laughs> so fraction E, so the power six over six minus fraction e to the power six over 18 plus e to the power six, get down fraction 108. And then finally, that'll actually turn into a minus 108, right?
and so they get 48.55, and this will make the one go up, so it will be two. Yes, it is the same. We can fit number five in here only because five is short. It was seven minutes, and number five is really, really short. I ran out of paper. What is the paper? So number five is actually from 8.3. This is the trigonometric section, but not the trig substitution section. Okay. So they'll give us trigs in the integral, not x's that we have to convert to trig. Sign cube and sign. Now, even though the bound to zero to pi over two, this does not fit the Wallace's theorem. Because Wallace's theorem has just cosine to a power or just sine to a power. And here I have cosines and sines, right? So we cannot use a Wallace. Even though it has those bounds, might think, oh, I can use it. You can't. So that has to just be one trick function with a power. Okay? And just one term. If I start trying to manipulate these and putting them all into sines, I mean, I guess you could eventually use Wallace's, but use up gets pretty faster. Okay, so here it's already set up for me because both of the exponents are odd. And since cosine is the guy that has the power, I'm going to let cosine be the unit. Okay, and then the derivative of cosine has a sine, isn't it? So we already have pretty much what we need for du. So we'll let u equal cosine of x, and then du would be negative sine x. Now, I don't have the negative, but that's okay. I could just divide by a negative one, right? And then I get that du over negative one is what will replace sine x dx. So the cosine cube will become u cube, and then this part here will become du over negative one. So this negative one, I'm just gonna pull it out as a multiplier. It's one over negative one, right? But what is one over negative one? It's just negative one, right? So that's why I have this guy in the front. Now I'm gonna integrate u cubed. So using our power rule, we get u to the fourth over four. But remember, these bounds are for x, not for u. So we have the back so we get negative one fourth actually, and then cosine of x to the fourth power. And we can plug in the pi over two and zero. Minus the negative one fourth cosine of zero to the fourth power. So cosine of pi over two, cosine pi over two is zero. Those two negatives will turn to a plus. And then cosine of zero should be one, but I'm gonna double check. Yes, one to the fourth power. So this is all just zero, and we end up with one fourth. If they want a decimal, that would be 0 0.25. It says to the hundredth, you can type this in and it's the same thing as to the hundredths because the hundredths would be this, right? Either one of these is going to work in the answer.
Okay, we're already at eleven forty eight, so I'm not gonna do <laughs> any more. But we can continue in the next class. Like how many are there? There was sixteen. Yeah, fifteen. A little bit I should be able to get all of them. I only have ten more to go. Okay, does anybody have any questions for me? I know you guys have been asking them throughout, so in case you don't have any chance. Uh, if there's no other questions, then you guys are free to go. And I will see you Wednesday, and we'll finish up the review. Hopefully, we get through all of it. You guys have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. You have a great one too, Professor.